for the 21st time in a row, the UN General Assembly overwhelmingly votes to condemn the United States economic embargo of Cuba in the policy's 50th year. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Kimberly Halkett. When the U.S. instituted its economic embargo of Cuba 50 years ago, the world was a very different place. It was the height of the Cold War. And Cuba was a pawn in the standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union. In the decades since the fall of the Iron Curtain, the United States has normalized relations with many old enemies. Though Cuba and Fidel Castro have continued to persist as the bogeyman in the minds of many American policymakers. But Cuba's gradually changing. Fidel's brother, Raul, is in power, and a number of significant reforms have been introduced. The size of the Cuban bureaucracy is being dramatically slashed, and free enterprise is being encouraged on a limited scale. What's more, last week, President Obama became the first Democratic presidential candidate to receive the majority of the Cuban-American vote, which has historically leaned Republican. Well, in his first term, President Obama eased some of the travel restrictions on Americans visiting Cuba, but could his second see more significant strides towards a normalizing of relations between the countries? Al Jazeera's Teresa Bo has been examining the history of the embargo and what effect it has on life in Cuba. In the wake of the revolution, the U.S. imposed an economic embargo on Cuba in 1962. The Cold War between the West and the Soviet Union was at its height. President Kennedy and his administration were deeply worried about Cuba's close links with Moscow. Though the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union collapsed more than 20 years ago, the embargo is still in place. And at this hospital, its effects are everywhere to be seen. Our hospital is on a list of places that are denied to access to U.S. companies because the U.S. government says we do not fulfill certain requirements. We must be supervised and cannot carry out surgeries on foreigners. Because of that, we are lacking some equipment needed. This is not charity. The embargo is a constant talking point on the island and most Cubans blame it for the shortages of everything from concrete to build roads and houses to food shortages. The United States is only 145 kilometers away from here, which makes it Cuba's natural trade partner. With the embargo, Cuba is forced to seek partners somewhere else, which authorities say makes it more difficult and expensive to bring goods to the island. The Cuban government says that in 50 years, the embargo has cost them around $900 billion. Analysts say that the effects of the embargo cannot be underestimated, but that it can't be blamed for mistakes committed by authorities here. We've had domestic failures and distortions that might have justified the embargo when it was implemented, but now it's irrational and generates more problems than solutions. For any country in the world to be threatened by a superpower contaminates the economy, investment and all commercial relations. Fifty years after it was imposed, the embargo has failed in its main objective, to topple the Castro's rule. The government here remains unchallenged while Cuba's most vulnerable continue to pay the costs. Teresa Bo, Al Jazeera, Havana. So what is the future for U.S.-Cuban relations? To discuss this, I'm joined by Larry Luxner, who edits Cuba News. Peter Kornblu is also here. He's the director of the Cuba Documentary Project at the National Security Archive. And last but definitely not least is Jose Cardenas, who among other things served in the State Department and National Security Council under George W. Bush. Uh, Larry, I want to start with you. So the UN General Assembly has voted for the 21st year in a row to condemn the U.S. embargo against Cuba. Uh, it hardly seems to be a headline though. Why is that? It's not. And it's uh, purely symbolic. It has no real practical value. Uh, 188 countries voted to condemn the embargo. The United States, Israel, and Palau voted against it, and I understand that Micronesia and the Marshall Islands have abstained. Uh, Palau is a population of 21,000. Uh, it's a former free associated state of the United States, so it's totally dependent on U.S. aid. Israel uh, is one of the largest investors in agriculture in, in Cuba, so uh, that 
that participation is purely political and uh, it has no it has no real strategic importance i think it's purely a symbolic statement of fact saying this is wrong it's immoral and it should end well it certainly is symbolic i'll give you that but there could be strategic you know importance in all of this i mean you know the fact that it is political is certainly one factor but there certainly seems to be at least a climate or a, sort of a mood shift that seems to be taking place in the united states and i want to just play you something that comes from president obama that really indicates a comment he made very early on, but plays a bit of a factor in here. Before he was elected president, Barack Obama argued the embargo on Cuba should end. Now, this is what he said when he was speaking in January of 2004. The Cuban embargo has failed to provide uh, the sorts of rising standards of living and has squeezed uh, the, the innocence in Cuba uh, and utterly failed uh, in the effort to overthrow Castro, which has now been there uh, since I was born. Uh, so uh, it, it's time for us to acknowledge that that particular policy has failed. Jose Cardenas, I mean, that was the president speaking in 2004 before he was a U.S. senator. But at the same time, it certainly does show the president's viewpoint. I mean, he makes the argument that this hasn't worked. Is it time to turn the page? Well, Kimberly, I, I think that uh, as president, uh, Barack Obama has been very careful in his approach to Cuba. And I think that, that you really can't find, uh, frankly, in many of his statements, anything that I would disagree with. Um, I think that he has been very careful in framing his initiatives towards the island that have changed policy under his administration from uh, the Bush administration as directly attempting to help the Cuban people quite apart from the Cuban government. So in his rhetoric, in his approach, he has been very careful to make distinctions between reaching out to the Cuban people and not the Cuban government. So I haven't seen any evidence that there is going to be a, uh, a jarring uh, change to the bilateral relationship in the next four years. Peter Kornblatt, do you agree with that? You know, it's hard to know. Barack Obama is a second-term Democrat now. He's the first uh, president uh, to be elected in recent memory in which Florida was not an electoral factor. He was, became president, and we didn't even know what the final results in Florida was. Uh, and he has a, a great increase in the number of Cuban-American voters in Florida and on his side. We're going to talk about those numbers in a second, but I do want to talk about what President Obama has done. I mean, we, we played that sound bite there. You heard sort of yeah. his position. In 2008, restrictions on remittances were lifted, and in 2001, restrictions on family travel were lifted. I mean, certainly it shows a president who has the intent of, of moving this forward. Well, to be, to be clear, his first term, he was very timid about any significant steps. He promised when he was running for president that he would turn the page uh, and write a new chapter in U.S.-Cuban relations, and he hasn't gone anywhere near that. He moved travel back to the era of the Clinton administration. George Bush had, had changed it and restricted it significantly. So we really aren't any further in terms of our bilateral contact, our ability to travel, than we were at the end of the Clinton administration. Now Barack Obama has a huge opportunity. He doesn't have to worry about the voters in Florida in another election because he's a second-term Democrat and he's not going to be reelected again. But the president, of course, cannot make these laws unilaterally. It comes down to the support of Congress. Congress right. writes the laws. There we have four Cuban Americans, very prominent in stature, but who are not sharing the president's position. So how, how does this work, Larry? I think, first of all, I agree with both, both of you, but I don't believe the relations can move forward until Alan Gross is released. Uh, this man has been in prison since December of 2009, and he's the single, his imprisonment is the single largest obstacle to an improvement in bilateral relations. And, of course, he is the USAID contractor who was arrested and remains yes. in a Cuban jail. Yes, and furthermore, he's lost uh, 105 pounds. He's uh, supposedly maybe suffering from cancer. Nobody knows. And the fact that he remains in prison after, uh, after almost three years uh, is a huge obstacle, and the State Department has made it very clear. In fact, Roberta Jacobson, in our interview that we did uh, two months ago with her, made it very clear that relations cannot move forward until this man is released. So is this something that you, you think is, is, is a factor that comes into play here, that there really Absolutely. cannot be any sort of discussion as Absolutely. long as he uh, remains in jail? I, I, I agree totally with Larry. I, I think that, uh, as Peter noted, uh, the president did uh, demonstrate a willingness uh, 
to uh, look, at, look at the issue, and I think that as soon as it became clear that Alan Gross wasn't coming home anytime soon, uh, I think that that, that, relation, that approach or that intent, uh, a willingness, basically uh, radically receded. And I think that, uh, the, that the Cuban government, obviously, is making a statement itself by continuing to hold him in that uh, what it translates into is that the uh, Cuban government is not going to make any fundamental changes in order to basically force the United States to have to to re-examine the issue. But it has made some, some fundamental changes. I mean, when you, you look at some of the reforms that have been implemented, I mean, recently the Cuban government introduced a number of limited reforms to its economic system. The economy is still under state control, but the aim is to promote economic growth. For the first time since the 1959 revolution, Cubans are allowed to sell and buy homes at prices they set, and they are now allowed to open small businesses and hire workers. And in 2011, around 350,000 people received licenses to start their own enterprises. And the government is also aiming to reduce bureaucracy and reduce the number of people employed by the state. So in 2014, 1.8 million state workers, which is 37% of the workforce, will lose their jobs. The government has also made it, though, easier for Cubans to travel abroad with citizens no longer needing expensive exit permits. And finally, in addition, the U.S. government has made it easier for Cuban Americans to visit the country, and they've also removed some of the hurdles to sending money to the island. So doesn't that appear to be some, some concrete sort of steps and statements that, that Cuba is making to the United States? Well, Cuba's not making those steps to the United States. Cuba's making those steps because internally, Raul Castro understands that those changes are necessary for the Cuban economy to, to survive and go forward uh, in, in this particular international context. Um, but the United States is the one country that has refused to acknowledge, really, these changes in Cuba and has done nothing to be supportive of them when there's a whole range of things that President Obama can do and should do and now has the opportunity to do uh, as a second term uh, president not worrying about re-election. He can loosen the embargo in a number of ways. He can legalize trade for uh, travel for all of us, not just Cuban Americans, but for all Americans to freely travel to, to Cuba. Um, he can uh, authorize certain elements of the embargo to be, uh, to be uh, set aside for, for the moment, more food, medicines. Um, uh, he, doesn't, he can take away the requirement, push for the requirement to be, to be terminated that, that these goods have to be paid for in advance, all the restrictions that were put in place during the Bush administration. Um, there are a series of gestures that he has to make, I think, before Cuba is going to consider the issue of Alan Gross in a positive light. There's got to be a number of kind of table-setting gestures that the United States has to make now uh, and should make. And I think, yeah, you know, th the problem is, is that uh, most policymakers in Washington do not believe that the onus is on the United States to make gestures to Cuba to, uh, to whatever, uh, try to engender change in Cuba. I think that if you go into any office, in, uh, official office in Washington that has any connection to Cuba policy, they're not going to, they certainly feel like the United States doesn't have the onus. It is the but Cuban government. But isn't that government. where the mistake lies? I mean, the fact that this policy has been in place, you know, 50 years, maybe it's time to refresh that attitude. Well, you mentioned at, at the top of the program that the world has changed. It certainly has. Unfortunately, it has changed very little in Cuba. Cuba still remains in the grip of an ideological dictatorship. There are tepid uh, reforms on the margin, but the fundamental relationship between citizen and state remains. This is a government that cannot tolerate any, any devolution of power to the people. And it clings to power relentlessly. And in I, fact- I'd like to make a point on that. Uh, we've talked a lot about the US elections, but the Venezuelan elections were also very significant in that the uh, re-election of Hugo Chavez guarantees a continued source of oil for the Cuban economy, which is the lifeline. And right now, uh, we've had two very significant headlines. We had the re-election of Chavez and the fact that the third exploratory oil well has come up dry. This is a devastating blow to the Cuban economy. They had pinned uh, high hopes on being not only self-sufficient in energy, but to become a net oil exporter.
and that's not going to happen now. Well, let's look at some of those numbers because we do have some of the economic numbers for Cuba. In fact, the Cuban government, in fact, says that their goal is to achieve 3% of gross uh, uh, domestic product. Let me say that in 3% growth of gross domestic product this year. And so far, GDP is 2.1% for the first half of 2012. GDP was 2.7% in 2011, 2.06 in January of 2010. And Cuba's highest recent GDP was 12.07% in January of 2006. I mean, how, how do you read those numbers? Keep Larry? in mind that Cuba is highly dependent on certain sectors such as nickel exports such as the export of medical services and also tourism. Tourism is doing quite well in Cuba. It, uh, it certainly makes them vulnerable, but at the same time, doesn't yeah. that also introduce the possibility for economic opportunity for the United it States? It does, but the United States, for example, right now, very few American tourists are actually going to Cuba. Who, I mean, th you have several tens of thousands of uh, Americans going via Canada, going via Mexico, third countries, but the bulk of those coming from this country are Cuban exiles who are going to visit their families. They're among the biggest per capita spenders in Cuba right now. Uh, but still, you have over one million Canadians visiting Cuba every year, and they're not subject to the embargo. That's keeping Cuba economically afloat, as is nickel exports, medical services exports, cigar exports, uh, uh, all kinds of little small sector exports. The problem is that until the United States lifts the embargo, uh, their economy will never really grow. Will so never so we're really in a, in a standoff game that has gone on decades. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem that we're turning the page? The embargo is the longest lasting failure in U.S. foreign policy history. Uh, we have stayed with it, not really for pragmatic reasons, but because of ideological and political reasons here at home. Florida, Florida, the swing state of Florida, and the grip that uh, hardline Cuban exiles have had uh, on the electoral process uh, translating into policy influence. But this is the, the issue here. If you have something, you keep beating, beating your head against the wall, you know, the solution is to stop beating your head against the wall. Uh, and in the case of the em embargo, it's time to lift the embargo and see the impact that that has on the hardliners in Cuba. If we, if the embargo is a sim symbol, it's a symbol of an abnormal relationship and of the U.S. effort to engage in regime change. Uh, in Cuba. And if we end our efforts at regime change, normalize relations, the hardliners in Cuba that run Cuba today won't really have a reason for being uh, in the near-term future. And eventually, uh, they, will, they will be set aside by, by, by others. And well, and given that climate, you talk about the election. I mean, is there this sort of element that the president now does perhaps have an obligation to, to revisit this? I mean, if you look at the poll numbers from the election, an exit poll carried out by Edison Research for media organizations found that 50% of Cuban voters in the U.S. voted for President Obama compared to 47% who voted for Mitt Romney. Now, by comparison, 75% of Florida Cubans voted for the Republican presidential candidate in 2000, 71 percent voted Republican in 2004, and 65 percent voted for the Republican candidate in 2008. So given that really historic result, I mean, Jose but Cardenas, really, uh, does, doesn't that not mean that, that the president has an obligation to, to deliver? Well, the, the, uh, you correctly noted that exit polls. Uh, what's happened since then is a lot of number crunching on actual results precinct by precinct in Cuban-American sectors of Florida that changed those numbers a bit. Still, it's without question that, uh, that President uh, Obama has uh, moved the needle uh, in terms of the Cuban-American vote in Florida. Now, uh, how he plans to proceed, uh, We'll see. But I do believe that it, it, uh, it indicates a, a, a contradiction in the Cuban-American community, which I think is, is best personified, not a contradiction, but con Congressman-elect Joe Garcia. He's a Democrat. He was just elected from Miami uh, this th last week. Uh, Mr. Garcia favors family travel, fav favors family contact, but he also supports the embargo. So the longer that the community is here, the more that, uh, that families uh, are settling on, ba on both sides of the straits, you're going to see people who believe in family contact, but they still have a, a tremendous aversion to the 50-year-old dictatorship 
that remains in Cuba. But, but Peter, isn't that generational? I mean, I know I've been down reporting of in course, Miami, and I've seen if, if you talk to younger Cuban Americans, mm -hmm. second generation, they have a very different view. And than those that of things their are changing. Florida is changing, and Florida, as a swing state, obviously was not a factor this year. But Barack Obama has to do this not because he's beholden or, 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 or needs to respond to Cuban-American votes. He has to do it because it's in the national interest of the United States. And the U.N. vote today is, again, a symbol. It's not a significant symbol, but it's a symbol reminding everybody that it is the United States now that is isolated on the embargo to Cuba. Um, when the embargo first started, the United States went around the world tw twisting arms, making sure that they, every other country lined up to isolate Cuba. And ironically, all these years later, it is we who are the isolated ones Indeed. in this policy. Indeed, I mean, 188 policy. countries. And the last, that, the last two summits in, in Latin America, let me just point out, the last two summits have been dominated by the issue of our policy towards Cuba, which the rest of Latin America opposes for a variety of significant reasons. And so for our own interests, economic corporate interests, policy interests, and to move the needle forward in Cuba about change in Cuba, we should change our policy. I think it's also important to note that states in the Midwest that stand to benefit from trade to Cuba have been in the forefront, including many Republican governors, of uh, lifting, the, uh, lifting the, uh, that part of the embargo that allows U.S. food exports to Cuba. In 2000, after Hurricane Michelle, uh, the law was changed. The, uh, uh, it's called TISRA, the uh, Trade and Reforms Export and Sanctions Act, uh, allowed for the first time U.S. exports, food exports, to Cuba after Fidel said he would not accept one grain of rice from the United States. You know, when uh, I have to say that when, when I see Peter Kornblou standing up for corporate America and, and cheering them on to, to uh, go into Cuba, uh, 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 maybe I should grab my wallet. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, again, let's, let, we, let's talk about history, and, and, uh, and Peter's right. Um, Cuba has a, uh, has, has a particular uh, role uh, uh, of symbolic importance to many countries in Latin America. But uh, when we see in the past 30 years the great sacrifices and the struggles made by Latin American countries to introduce democracy into their countries. The whole wave of military dictatorships is all now in the dustbin of history. And we have one holdout who expressly rejects more freedom for its people, more, uh, more uh, economic uh, uh, opportunity for its people that would come with liberalizing and opening up. We have to stand for something. Ten years ago, so, the, so are you saying then that basically what it comes down to is that the United States is simply waiting for Fidel Castro to die? Well, I think that they would probably die, either, both brothers will probably die before they institute the kind of reforms that would bring Cuba back into step with the rest of the rest of Latin America. I have America. a question, Fid Jose. Fid Don't you think it's ludicrous that the United States continues to list Cuba as a sponsor of terrorism? along with Iran, Syria, and Sudan, when we have taken North Korea, Libya, and, uh, and God knows how many other countries off the list that are far more of a threat to, I think to our that, country. I think that countries that have been taken off the terrorist list have given the U.S. A, an express reason for doing so. We have not But Raul done Castro, to his credit, in July 2012, you know, just a few months ago, said, look, I'm willing to, to talk. I'm willing to hold a bilateral conversation on right. anything. Does but there's Cuba code. really sponsor terrorism against the I United think States? That, I well, think I, so. for me, I don't have me a statue. I don't have a statute of limitations. If this, if this government, if the Castro regime came out and reputed, repudiated, it's 30 years of of support for subversion in Latin America and Africa and uh, repudiated its support for, for, uh, for Puerto Rican terrorists in the United States or repudiated its support for American criminals now in safe haven in Cuba and, and sought the United States to, sought some way to answer for it then I would say, but, but, let's but, take them off. But, but this but, is a, a big st a stumbling block right now to Cuba. The fact that it's on the State Department terrorist list means Cuba cannot access IMF funds. It can't be a member of the World, well, World Bank, it is, but it can't, it can't do normal import-export. 
And, and I, I, think, I think of it really, and Peter, I'll give you the last word here because we're almost out of time, but if it was a legitimate uh, national security concern, wouldn't there be even more of an impetus then to, to take more involvement and role in seeing some kind of reforms being made, given the fact that the proximity is 140 kilometers from the U.S. shore? That's right. We, we have defeated ourselves with this policy. We discredited ourselves by putting Cuba on the terrorism list, which everybody knows around the world it doesn't belong there. Uh, we have defeated ourselves by continuing this embargo, which the whole world now votes against every year. Um, John Kennedy famously said uh, the world thinks we're a little demented when it comes to Cuba and 50 years later they still think so um, because our policy hasn't changed. Obama has the opportunity to move forward with a new type of policy towards Cuba. It'll be in U.S. interest and eventually in Cuba's interests as well. Gentlemen, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for your participation in this discussion. And that is all from the team in Washington, D.C. For now, thanks for watching Inside Story from the Americas.